Okay, I'm excited as always. You got to be excited when you get to bring on the latest and greatest and uh, just updated as well. My calendar, which is kind of a big deal. Sometimes, Clint, I go a month and people get so mad at me when I do, you know, lives and different things. They're like, you didn't update your calendar. And so um, you're still you know, in December. You're still in, you're still in 2019. <laughs> What's the deal? Back to the future as we go and, and make it happen. But uh no, I'm just really excited. One of the things that I love the most about what I get to do is I get to collaborate with all these superstars and legends and and I get to learn so much from them and what they do and what works and what's not working and what they're up to and what they're excited about. And it's just so fun. It's so fun to be able to do that. I first met Clint. I think I first met you, if I'm if I'm remembering right. It was at a restaurant. I can't remember if it was Cubby's. I want to say Cubby's. I think it was. Yeah, it's with good friends. Um, haven't seen him in years. Stefan. And it was probably, do you, you want to say six years ago? Is that yeah. how long ago it was? Easily. Yeah. Yeah. Six, six. And you, were, you weren't even public speaking. You were talking a little bit about doing some entertaining and different things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you summer, went, but, yeah, you it went right into it. And just bam, like one of the hardest professions to break into it. I mean, for me, it was like forced where I didn't feel comfortable doing it for seven, eight years. And this dude here is just like, you know, he's got the slick back hair. He's just like, I got this, goes in. And it's next thing you know, that's the only reason I get booked. It's just the geez. hair. So. I was like one of the top speakers in the entire world. Uh, become a good friend. It's been fun just going back and forth on different ideas. And, and one of those ideas we'll talk about is, is a new book that you told me when we talked two years ago, it was, it was ready. It was coming out. And this was two years ago. I remember where I was when I was talking to you and we were going back and forth in different things. And so we'll go through that. But before that, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, a little bit of of your journey because do you know what I still have your your name saved as from all those years ago? I'm gonna look it up right here. I'm, gonna show I'm, you. I'm afraid to know, Rob. It says Clint Orthopedic. Yes. <laughs> you no. Know, wow, that seems like forever ago. Isn't that funny? Yeah. That's what I have your cell phone name. I gotta update it. It's Clint the baller, shot caller, superstar, public speaker of the world. Yeah. Still trying to figure his life out. That's what it is. So give us a, we'll jump into a little bit of this. We're going to talk about, I've got on my other screen right here, like you're awesome. Your book, How Great Leaders Create Organizations, Their People Never Want to Leave. He promised me an early copy has not come in yet, but I did order a bunch of copies already. I think I ordered 30 or 40 copies. Can't remember how many. So I pre-ordered those. But before we go into that, let's, let's hear, let's hear a little bit about your background, your journey. Yeah, dude. So I, I started out when I was a young kid, man, and I, I just wanted to be a pilot. Like, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to fly. I got an eye disease early on in my life, and uh, that ended that flying career really quick. And so uh, I had no idea what to do in my life. So what do you do? You go to college, right? So ended up going to college, and I graduated, and everybody said, well, you need to get a job. You need to have benefits. You need to support a family, make money. And my dad was in the medical field and I thought, okay, well, there's a job that's always going to be around. And so I jumped into the medical field and was doing orthopedic sales in the OR. So miserable, uh, literally just existing every day. And I had, a, I had a buddy, I had a mentor in my life. Uh, he shared a quote with me by Oscar Wilde. And the quote says, to live is the rarest thing in the world. For most people just exist and that's all. And every day, dude, I was just existing, nine to five, rinse and repeat, doing the same thing every single day. And I sat down with three buddies and I said, wouldn't it be crazy if you could find a job that allowed you to do three things? One, it allowed you to play to your passions. That's the first P. Like you could, you could have a job that let you do what you love most of the time. And second, you could provide, you know, like if you want to live as a responsible human being, life costs some money. So it would allow you to provide in a way that was sufficient for you. And then third, the third P was purpose. What if the job allowed you to do something bigger than yourself most of the time? And uh, man, long story short, I, I proposed that to my two buddies and they were like, dude, that I don't know if that exists. Like what you're talking about is so rare. It's an anomaly. And, uh, and that triggered that quote by Oscar Wilde, to live is the rarest thing in the world. And I, I looked at him and I said, I, 
I don't believe you. And two weeks after that, I quit my job and jumped into the world of professional speaking and started the undercover millennial program. And dude, it's been a rodeo ever since. And t- tell us a little bit, what's the undercover millennial throwdown for those that haven't been <laughs> following your journey like I have? Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's like undercover boss without the makeup. Uh, I am the undercover. Makeup? Come on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have a little blush on today. Um, yeah. So how it would work is I obviously am a millennial. And so I would go undercover into an organization as someone who was looking for a job. So I'd walk into the Chick-fil-A, I'd walk into the Verizon store and I'd walk up to the first person that I saw and I would say, Hey, I'm just, I'm looking for a job. I'm looking uh, for work. What's it like to work here? And then they'd always get quiet. They'd look around. I always felt like an illegal drug exchange. And then they would tell me everything. Everything, the good, the bad, what they loved, what they hated, what they loved about their manager, the, the person they, that they couldn't stand, whether they would recommend the job or not. And the magic behind all of the research was not when an employee was dissatisfied with their, their culture or their manager. The magic was when I would go up to an employee and I would say, what's it like to work here? And they would respond with, I love it here. I love my job. I love what we're doing. Our culture, my manager, Susie, you got to meet Susie. She's amazing. You should apply. It's just, it's a great place to work. And then when that response would trend in an organization, I'd go to the next employee and the next and the next. And then the magic behind how great leaders were creating that type of loyalty. They were creating organizations that people never wanted to leave. And uh, over the, it's been over five years, man, that I've been doing this. And uh, we've worked with 181 organizations and I have interviewed undercover over 10,000 employees. And uh, that's why we decided to title the book. I love it here. How great leaders create organizations that people never want to leave. And it is all of the research from my undercover work. And it's cool, Rob, because it's not another, uh, it's not another leadership book written by a leadership expert. This is a book that is written through the lens of 10,000 employees who knew when their leaders were getting it right. That's the difference. And uh, it, it was a beautiful experience to be able to tell their story. And uh, yeah, also a lot of work. I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet as you were doing the research, I bet you some of the things that you already knew were confirmed and other things were just huge insights. One of the things that those that follow me know I always say is successful people just do the basics better. And it's coming back down to the core basics that we need to do in those core basics, you know, as, as we're building, I think a lot of people just forget some of the basics. Like I'll give one of the very basics that, you know, it'd be interesting to see in all your interviews. Cause I have not been able to, to read the book yet, but I'm excited. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Like this Probably is right in the mail, man. It's in the mail. It's in I the should mail. go check. Maybe it's there. I should yeah, go yeah. check. You should. But um, when I wrote my book, the game of networking, I wrote down, oh, I, I want to say I had like 30 different strategies for networking, like for any profession, anything you wanted. And then I narrowed it down to four basic principles. And so I'm curious to see how these go with some of the things that you've learned. And maybe later you, after this, you can tell me what I'm missing so I can write part two as we go. I love to hear them. <laughs> but uh, the first one, and these are all simple, is the law of likability. Like, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you're not likable, people find ways to not want to work with you. They find ways to find fault. They find ways, right? And that goes with a lot of things. There's appreciation, right? A lot of things go with likability. And that was the very first thing. And then the second thing that was challenged was, why would someone not want to work with you if you're likable? Like, we all got that family member we love to death, but they're not credible, Right. It's like Johnny's a fake. Like, I love Johnny. Johnny is my favorite person, but I cannot recommend Johnny to you. And so that was the second. And the third one was it was a lot of recallability slash visibility. So if you're trying to network or get something done, if people aren't thinking of you, then it doesn't matter how likable or credible you are. Yeah. Right. So yeah. The number one currency for marketing is is attention and it's doing it of course in the right way and then the last one's a lot of profitability why would someone not want to work with you or refer you well 
if you're likable, credible, and you got that visibility slash recallability, you got to create a win-win. And a win-win doesn't always mean money. But if I go to Clinton, I'm like, hey, we're going to do equal work. We got equal credibility. And I'm going to take 99% of the profits. Yeah, it's not a win-win, right? So it's got to be a win-win. And sometimes it's the connection and relationship and the knowledge and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I, I'd be fascinated. I'm excited because what I love doing is challenging principles. And I want to challenge some of these as I go through your book. And I know specifically for the profession um, that I focus on with direct sales, I think this is specifically very, very important because I've seen the difference for those that are are good leaders versus great leaders. So what are some of maybe the biggest differences you've seen between, you know, a subpar average leader and maybe a good leader, a great leader, you can give two or three categories, whatever you want. And then for those of you that are just tuning in, the best place they can get your book, and I'll put it in the I'll put it, you know, for all of those that are watching. If you're listening to the podcast, you can't see any comments, but look up I Love It Here by Clint Pulver. And we'll put that here. And it's the best place, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. Thank you, Rob. That's really nice of you, man. Um, here's the thing. So in my research, you have in an organization, you have a leader, right? And they're all about where are we taking the ship? I want to get as many people following me in a direction, right? If you're a great leader, you have followers and you're moving somewhere. You have, you have a destination. Then there's the manager. It's all about, okay, what are the inner workings of how do we make this happen? Okay, we have a vision. But how do we make this happen? How do we develop people? How do we hit the quotas? How do we keep scaling and growing and making sure the ship stays a ship, right? Where are the leaks? How do I patch the leaks? But to your employees, it was not the it was not the leader. That's not who they talked about. It was not the manager. That was not mm -hmm. who they talked about. It was the mentor. Mentorship versus management and leadership was the most iconic person, the most iconic, iconic character that built the highest sense of loyalty, engagement, and respect. Uh, the cool thing about mentorship is it's not a title. You cannot be given the title of a mentor. You have to earn that. Uh, you know, you might have the title of a supervisor or a director, but you cannot become a mentor until the mentee invites you into their heart. And this beautiful characteristic of mentorship earned a sense of engagement, loyalty, all the things that we want as leaders from our people. Right. If you're in the direct sales world, you have your team and you're wanting them to produce. You're wanting them to to grow. You're wanting them to succeed. But mentorship is giving those people a reason to connect with you because of who you are. You know, you talked about your four characteristics. I think they were spot on, Rob. We found that there's five characteristics in mentorship in what makes a mentor a mentor. And number one is is confidence. I want to mentor with someone who is confident in who they are. They're also confident in their dialogue, what they're teaching me about, whether it's the sales process or whether it's about how to communicate. Like, do you have yeah. a sense of confidence in that? The second one was credibility, right? Which you hit on. I want to know your resume. What's your background? What's your history? Number three, though, was competence. You might know everything about the game of basketball, but can you get out and shoot a hoop? Mm -hmm. Right? I want to learn from someone who's a practitioner. Not someone who's just read a bunch of leadership books. Yeah. Like, do you actually live and breathe the things that you're talking about? And then, and then, uh, the, n number four was candor, oddly enough, right? The ability to, to be honest. I don't want to mentor with someone that's going to constantly blow smoke or tell me how wonderful I am and give me all of this fluff. Like, I want to, I want to mentor with someone who's going to give me honest feedback to help me to be better. And then the last five is, is caring, the ability to honestly care for individuals. They had the ability to advocate for a person, not just develop them. And if you think about, you know, any great film or a story or a play, you always have like the hero, right? The main hero in the story. And then who shows up? It's the mentor. Like uh, Luke Skywalker, right? He had yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, Frodo. I love Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Frodo had Gandalf. Uh, Aladdin had the genie. Uh, Katniss had Hamish. Right, these great mentors that because of who they were, they connected people to their dreams. And those people said, I like myself best because of you. That, that was one of the most beautiful things that we saw 
in our research, not leadership, not management, mentorship. That's very interesting. I mean, I love all those and I love the way you put them. You talked about it was confidence, credibility, competency, caring was the fifth one. What was the fourth one? And then candor, the ability to have honest communication. Like you build yeah. relationships so strong that honesty could exist. Yeah, It's interesting because that's one of the top questions I deal with, with emerging leaders. And they're scared to have those deliberate, um, direct conversations many times. And I'm like, look, it's part of the process. They can't grow. You can't grow. Like you're both stunting it if you don't have those conversations. And I know it can be scary, but it's part of the process. And I, I love those, those five C's and the way they're laid out because they all encompass, I mean, everything from, from caring, right? Like yeah. so if you don't care, nobody cares about you. And I love how you started out the beginning as well, talking about, you know, the, the confidence, but then as people are leading into it, you mentioned before that, that it's not a position. It's something that people have to earn. And I know your book was recommended already from John Maxwell. He's the leadership legend. I got to go out like a, just over a year ago and just uh, hang out with him in a small group of people with one of his, one of his book launches. And I remember him saying that Leaders, true leadership is leading through influence, not through title. Yes. And that is just stuck with me because when we look at the servant leaders that are true leaders, right? Not dictators, true leaders. They're leading through influence like people like Gandhi, right? No one had to follow them. They wanted to. Martin Luther King, right? It wasn't a position of title. And those are the ones that actually had the biggest influence and the most impact. So I like how you started that with the difference between someone being a mentor, right? Versus a manager or somebody yeah. being an yeah. owner. Yeah. And that's who we remember. You know, if, if you were to, you know, could you name like the last three NFL MVPs or who are the last two Miss Americas? Or do you know, like who are the last two Academy Award winners for best actor? Like, honestly, Rob, I have no clue. I could not. I, I, I don't know. No, you're not asking me because I don't know, man. Yeah, right. But yet in this world, we deem them as some of the most successful, popular, beautiful, elegant, famous, whatever you want to call it, types of people. Nothing wrong with those things. But most people have no idea who they are. They don't know. But then if I ask the question, you know, tell me the name of the teacher that made a, the biggest difference in your life. You know, what, what's their name? me, I, Mr. Jensen. I'll never forget Mr. Jensen, right? Because those were the people that got to the part about me. It's the difference between successful leadership versus significance and, and, and earning it, right? Mentorship. Uh, that Those are the people that become legendary in our lives. They become memorable, influential because they got to the part about us. That is what I learned in, in the research as well, is that every employee is asking you as a leader, let me know when what you do and why you do it, let me know when it gets to the part about me. And sometimes we hear that and we go, well, those entitled little shining stars <laughs> in my life, right? Like, let me know. But again, I don't. it's not about entitlement. It's about good business. It's about bringing humanity back into the workplace. No significant loyalty ever happened without significant connection. And I think the better we are at doing that in leadership, the more influential and lasting that influence becomes. Incredible. I, I can't wait to get it. Uh, I know it's going to apply massively and I'm excited for you to come to Sundance. I haven't made that announcement yet. So those that are, yeah, I'm pumped for that. Those that are listening, get to hear, but uh, Clint's going to be a guest speaker at my breakthrough mastermind in Sundance, Utah, I think we got them pegged, I don't know, May 1st, May 2nd, one of those dates. We got it in the calendar, but uh, that'll be a ton of fun to have him there. So best place to get his book is to get it on Amazon. I love it here by Clint Pulver. If you go Google it, you'll or not Google it. You just put it in a little search engine on Amazon. You'll find if you Google it, you'll find it as well, actually, because I've done that. But uh, go to Amazon, look for it there, get it, pre-order it right now. Where's the best place for them to follow you on social media, Clint? Uh, Instagram. I love Instagram. It's a great, uh, yeah, Facebook as well, but 
I'm on Instagram a lot. I love that. It's, well, you're a millennial, so you have to be. Right? It's where we, it's where yeah. we hang. Where, where's the, what's your handle on Instagram? Just Clint Pulver. Super easy. complicated. Easy, easy, easy. Go find Clint on Instagram. Go get his book. Clint, thanks so much for being on. I appreciate your time. I know you're you're slamming podcasts all day, every day right now and doing all these trainings as your book just came out. So I appreciate you fitting me in and, and getting me in your schedule, my man. No, dude, listen, Rob, I appreciate you, man. Uh, you are someone that literally lives and breathes what you preach and the advocacy, the support. You've always been a homie. You've always been there for me. And yeah, it means a lot. I appreciate it. Hey, we'll have to do this again and follow up with part two, post book insights. It's gonna be fun. You guys um, will want to I don't know too. if I'm alive. I might have oxygen, a few IVs in my body, but yeah, let's do it. <laughs> if I'm alive, <laughs> we'll do it. Well, thank you, Clint. Thanks everyone for tuning in. As always, until the next time.